Well, welcome to York County on Community 7 Television. I'm Shoots Beast and I'm your host. Each month we look at a different aspect of what's going on in Yellowstone County. And this month we've got Dennis Pittman with us. Dennis is a county commissioner. He's been a county commissioner for a while now. So Dennis, thanks so much for coming down. Thanks for having me. All right, absolutely. Um, before we get into what's going on with the county and all of the stuff and neat stuff, tell us about your background, your history. How did you get to become a Yellowstone County Commissioner? Oh, wow. It's, a, it's quite a journey. We actually served together on the Billings City Council. I was on the council for about eight years. Um, always kind of wanted this as my dream job. I had ran for the legislature, and God's infinite wisdom <laughs> kept me out of that, that realm. Yeah. Um, but led me into the city council, local government, and I fell in love with local government. Yeah. Uh, and have been here and have no desire to go anywhere else. All right. Give us a little bit, compare and contrast. Like yeah. you said, we mentioned uh, we served on the city council together, and now you're with uh, Yellowstone County. Well, yeah. uh, they're both local governments, but give us some compare and contrast. What are the differences, and what are the similarities? Yeah, you know, the, the, the difference is really the amount of control. Uh, I mean, the budgets are, are totally different. You have $300 million and $100 million basically, are your differences in budget. Um, but we don't have a city administrator. We are the administration. And so the three of us together have to work together to, to work with uh, controlling the county. Uh, whereas the city, you have a city administrator, which is controlled by the council, and then all of the department heads are, are controlled by the city administrator, which was something that really, you know, you, you would appreciate this more than anybody. But when I became a commissioner, uh, I went, okay, now how do I, who do I talk to to talk to Road and Bridge Department? Yeah. And they looked at it and they said, Commissioner, you <laughs> just go talk to the Road and Bridge Department. Yeah. And, and whereas a council person, you had to go to the city administrator to talk to Public Works or something like that. Yeah. So that's probably the biggest difference. Uh, that and it's a full-time job. It, uh, it has a, a full salary and benefits package to it that's full-time. So you get to dedicate all of your time to doing this. Uh, whereas council, you're you're expected to be running your life and doing your business plus fitting in city council at the same time. Sure. So having that perspective of coming from the council and, and with uh, with Yellowstone County, talk about uh, talk talk about that city uh, urban county interface and yeah. what are some of the issues you see in that interface um, because. Chances are, yeah, you if you're putting that subdivision right on the city limits, chances are probably someday you're going to be in the exactly. in the in the city. Yeah. And so, but if you're building that subdivision or that one lot, you know, somewhere north of Broadview, you're probably, probably. not ever going to be part of the city of Billings. Right. So, talk about some of those challenges on that on that interface, right. on that urban interface. So, on the council. Uh, we did a lot of stuff, and, and part of that started with you and, and the infrastructure. We put a lot of energy into the what I call non-sexy underground stuff, water, sewer, infrastructure, kind of the guidelines for how we wanted our city to grow. We had seen things happen in Bozeman or Kalispell, and we wanted to have at least the infrastructure. I, I always, I've always believed that Billings and Yellowstone County were going to explode at some point. It just The growth was going to be phenomenal, and we've done that. We have done... A plus. I give you, I give all of us an A plus for the infrastructure and billings. Um, what we're seeing now is that that jagged line of city, county, city, county, and people getting frustrated because they're on one of those roads where it's a disaster because half of it's city, half of it's county. This, this, this group annexed into the city, these didn't. So you've got water, sewer, some services, some are getting city services, some aren't. And, and that's kind of where that, that clash is happening right now. We didn't just go boom and take another big step out and annex a whole par, uh, portion of the, the county. So that, that becomes our biggest struggle right now is providing those services in a, in a simple, concise way, not leapfrogging so that we send something clear out you know, to where it's going to take 10, 20 years of infill to, yeah. to develop. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about some of the infrastructure that you do have in Yellowstone County. Probably, I would guess, maybe the biggest piece of infrastructure in Yellowstone County is Metro Park. Metro Park. Um, and there has been a lot going on at Metro Park. In fact, we had uh, Bill Dutcher and Tim Goodrich on. Normally, we just go down there for the fair because that's the big deal. But there has been so much going on at yeah. Metro Park that we had him come on. And I think Bill only got to talk about the fair for five minutes, which probably broke wow. his heart. It probably <laughs> broke his heart a little bit, but we did have so much you other You actually stuff. kept Bill on track and we got did, to talk we about We did, we well, relatively, okay. relatively. I was going to say. Um, but talk to us about what's been going on at Metro Park, the master plan, and, and, and kind of how that all, the, that all of that's coming together. Absolutely, yeah. So there's 189 acres at Metro Park. 
and, and most, most people think we have about 50. We have probably right now 50 of it that is usable and most people are aware of. Um, the rest of it's been what's called the backside. Mm -hmm. So everything from pretty much the grandstands to the river has been not well utilized over the last decade. Yeah. Um, we, we changed that just in the fact of, of necessity, really. Uh, not only the, the vision of moving our county forward and that we had this incredible asset sitting in the middle of our community, but a lot of it was crumbling. Uh, we had the grandstands literally were falling apart and they were becoming a safety issue. Uh, a lot of the barns and things like that were falling apart and just crumbling and, and we were just afraid of a lot of liability issues as well. Plus, at the same time, we had this, this epiphany that we wanted to do a master plan and turn this from good to great. It's my latest book I've been <laughs> reading. So everybody, everybody's tired of me talking about it, but the book Good to Great is, is really the vision I have for Metro Park in that we, we have this incredible opportunity. We have 189 acres to do some amazing things and, and to show the community that we can do more than one thing at a time. We can have something going on in the arena, the Expo Pavilion, down at the carnival lot um, in the backside now as as we look at putting in uh, additional parking maybe an rv park uh, an indoor dirt arena that seats maybe 4500 people maybe an outdoor amphitheater uh, all these things so we've started engaging the public asking them what they want what they don't want what their expectations are going to be if we do build this what are they willing to pay for and at the same time we're going if we raise our standards uh, are you willing to pay for it if, if the quality's there? And, and the answer we're getting is absolutely. But we expect if we're gonna invest, we want it taken care of. Um, I think they're, they're seeing 30 years of, of, like I just said, of decay and things just falling apart. They don't wanna see that happen again. They wanna see us do an active maintenance program if, if we're gonna go forward. Sure, absolutely. Um, what uh, what events have are starting to come back to Metro Park? and? Really, how hard a hit was this on Metro Park, the COVID, the pandemic, and, you know, yeah. probably uh, we all know about social distancing and masking and, and all of that. But right. the one thing that that was probably just an absolute is we're not going to have 10,000 people in a small space. Right. Which is this is what Metro Park does. Right. You know, and so yeah. uh, that's just probably not really a grand idea, um, right. you know, to do something like that. So. How hard has this been on Metro Park and how is it emerging from, yeah. from so the pandemic? So I always like to take all the negatives and turn them into positives. Mm -hmm. and, and when you look at, this was probably the only time in our history where we're gonna be able to shut down yeah. the entire campus yep. and, and actually do some things. So we did some significant things, not only tearing things down, new parking lots, a lot of things that we improved on over the last year, but it also gave us a way to look at the whole campus and go, what can we be doing differently? What should we be doing differently? And, and throughout the whole conversation, going, what are gonna be the expectations coming out of this? If we're gonna be able to put 10,000 people in the arena, then we've gotta have a better filtration system, we've gotta have more safety and security, we've gotta have plans for all of this. We've gotta make sure we're disinfecting the place uh, and, and doing all of that. And so what we tried to do is keep a few little things going at Metro throughout the last year, and we did that, um, even to the, the point of taking a loss and still having the fair. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to be able to show people that we were still trying to do something for some kind of normalcy, but at the same time taking precautions and learning. And we kind of took that as a, as a role of leading by example, okay? Yeah. We're gonna try to do something. We, we've got these people telling us, we had those like Ghostbuster guns mm -hmm. where we could spray the disinfectant and it had a negative neutron, uh, elect it would just go and cling to things and disinfect. Yeah. So we were like, well, let's try it here. Let's try some events. Um, what we saw were we were getting about a quarter of the attendance that we would get for anything. So yeah. it kept just on its own. We didn't have to be turning people right away. They just weren't coming. Yeah. But at the same time, we were able to start getting our new standards and procedures, disinfecting, cleaning, all of that under control to where now I think we have some great systems in place that assure the public that when they come there, we are doing everything we can to keep them safe. And now with some of this federal money, we're looking at a whole new air filtration system, ways to vent the building, and, and that's part of the master plan too. We're looking that the arena probably has to become a clean arena. We can't keep bringing dirt in and then try to keep it clean. Yeah. Uh, when we start looking at the numbers, we start realizing other than PBR, uh, most dirt events brought about 35 to 4,500 people into the arena. 
So rather than build a, a church for an Easter Sunday, mm -hmm. let's go build a dirt arena that seats 45, 5,500 people at max with some, some more airflow air things and like that and do that over there, keep the arena clean and then have maybe HEPA filters or whatever kind of filtration system that pulls air up and out all the time and keeps people safer. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know there was um, some discussion uh, with the school district about putting a, a facility down there. Right. Uh, I, and I know the commissioners discussed it, but what I don't know is, you know, what were the details of those discussions and why did sure. you guys come to the decision that you did? So yeah. walk us through that and, and sure. what were your discussions you had and then what discussions did you have in turn? What discussions yeah. did you have with school district? What discussions did you guys have internally and why did you come to the decision sure. that you did? So we, we, we had this idea of, of the master plan probably well over a year ago. And we started reaching out to, to people in the community internally as far as the school, the city, uh, different school districts throughout our county going, what are your needs? Uh, the school district too came to us and said, if, if there's a way to put a football stadium out there, that would be awesome. And we said, well, let's look at it and see what that would look like, what the partnership would have to be, how can this work, what kind of space you need, things like that. Yeah. Uh, and we engage. I mean, you can't just say, no, we're not interested. Let's, yeah. let's engage and talk about it and see if this is going to be feasible for both of us. Um, sounded like a great idea initially. Um, as we started looking at the footprint of the space needed, and then it kind of kept getting bigger. Not only was it a football field, then it was a track, then it was all these other things. It was taking up a substantial portion of the facility. And um, then there were some issues with uh, who gets what and who sells what tickets and who gets to schedule and then some of the outer school districts that don't play well with each other yeah. too start going well why would we pay to build a, a, a stadium for school district two and we finally once we did all the numbers and started engaging the community found that while it was a great idea maybe not there uh, great opportunity there is we had enough people at the table with the conversation that with uh, the South Side TIF district, mm -hmm. that there were some opportunities to save the taxpayers some money and maybe find some space out in that area sure. by near Amen Park to, yeah. to maybe do some kind of facility. Um, and, and so what we kind of said, maybe not us, but here the, there are some other opportunities yeah. in the community to, to look at. And so I, I still see it as a win-win. I think we had a great conversation. It led us to some places we didn't expect to be, um, which, goes back to my book that I'm that book I'm reading on good to great you know if you're on the bus and all you can see is getting from point A to point B and you're not willing to look at the journey then you miss all these other opportunities and and that's where I'm at right now I'm just looking out the window going oh but there's that that oh can we go here can yeah. we do that yeah. and, and that's part of where we're at now with it so we, we kind of we, we finally just to be fair to the school district just said at this point we just don't see how feasibly it can go forward it's not working for us um, because part of what we're trying to do with the taxpayers is say, well, we want to build our things that have return on investment. So we don't have to ask you for so much. And so every, every space has to become profitable or be able to generate revenue to offset the cost of building it so that I don't have to go to the taxpayers and ask them to, to cover that charge. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right. Anything else on Metro Park that we need to touch on, or that we didn't that we didn't? No, uh, you know the the thing there is is what well, exactly what I just said. We're doing a lot of the the, stu the ugly stuff right now, sure. whether it be tearing down barns mm -hmm. or building the infrastructure, so that as we come out with the plans, and I'm sure you've had some of them on talking yeah. about the master plan, yeah. but there get the get the stuff that people really don't like paying for uh -huh. done first. Yeah. And that and what I encourage people right now to do is drive around Metro Park. I know it sounds weird because you've never been allowed on the backside, mm -hmm. but nobody's going to put you in jail. I <laughs> promise you. But I, I'm going to encourage you to just drive around Metro Park. The gates are usually open. Um, you can see what's missing. You can see kind of the vision. And you can start getting an idea of what the whole 189-acre campus yeah. is. And, and that's what I kind of see it as now is a campus. No, whether you're coming from Lockwood or you're coming from the Heights on 4th Avenue, downtown Billings, however you're approaching it, it should look beautiful. Yeah. It should be, a, a, you know, we just had a, a, a meeting today talking about the beautification, what, what the perimeter of Metro Park should look like. Yeah. Rather than a minimum security prison with razor wire, <laughs> maybe we should look a little more welcoming. Yeah. You know, things yeah. like that. And yeah. so those are the vision we've got. Uh, I think we're going to be able to do this for a lot less money than 
originally planned. We got a, a bill through the legislature this year that allows us to extend our public-private partnerships. Oh, okay. So right now, the state law had been, well, the state law had been, we could only engage in seven-year contracts, hmm. up to seven years. So what we had done in the past, we'll go, you know, Shoots, I'll give you a seven-year contract with an automatic renewal <laughs> of seven years, yeah. and then most likely another seven years. And then, then the numbers would pencil out for you to do an sure. investment with me. What we're finding is that the, the banks aren't good with that. Yeah. They want to see a 30-year contract. Because mm -hmm. we're asking, if, if you come to me and say, hey, I want to build an RV park at Metro, yeah. but it's going to cost me $10 million. Yeah. It doesn't pencil out in seven years. Right. Um, over 30 years, it'll pencil out. Yeah. Um, so whether the taxpayers are footing it or, or not, or we get a private par uh, business to do it, yeah. it still pencils out. So the legislature has granted us up to 40-year contracts with some of these places so we can actually start engaging different entities to build some of these facilities for us run them manage them we'll take a portion of their their revenues like we would anyway but not have to be experts in rv parks or amphitheaters mm -hmm. or maybe even the dirt arena yeah. and and let other people professionally do that and run it and take care of the grounds sure so another thing that's going to be important to Yellowstone County, and we, we've talked about it um, with uh, the urban interface and a little bit with Metro, is how we get around uh, the town, Holy cow, you know, and right. the roads that are that are there. So, uh, you know, again, we're getting into that. Uh, okay, you're going to come into buildings from Yellowstone County right. through Yellowstone County, right. and there's places of Yellowstone County that are quite rural, and there are places of Yellowstone County that are quite urban. So. Talk about some of the major transportation projects that are going on uh, across Yellowstone County and how they're going to impact Yellowstone County. Yeah, so this is where I get excited. Okay, <laughs> uh, so I got to sit at the edge of my seat. So this is this is decades worth of work that are coming together in the next five years. Um, we got the build grant through the Inner Beltway, we, so the money is there to build the road connecting Zimmerman Trail to to Wicks Lane. Okay. Um, the Billings Bypass, billingsbypass.com, you can go there right now. You can see the bridge being constructed. You actually can see it live as they're putting it together. Um, that's in a, in a phased approach, which will do that as well. And so within the next five years, that, that project will be complete. We're doing our, our road construction on the west end and expanding some of those areas. Uh, Johnson Lane, the interstate, who would have thought that we needed a, a three lanes on each side of the interstate from Lockwood to to the west end, mm -hmm. and that's where we're going. DOT is finally, you know, moving that, those projects forward. So um, I say that the next five years are exciting, but they're also going to be a traffic nightmare <laughs> uh, because all of these new pieces are, are people want them in place now, but they're they're obstructing things to have to make things better. Yeah. Um, when you have to start messing with the interstate anywhere around Billings, that that means that makes a lot of problems. But when it, the final product is done, yeah. we're going to be set for some amazing opportunities in Billings. We're, we're also now starting to look at the entryways, something we, we I don't think uh, people 20 years really thought about. Sure. Uh, and, and we're starting to say, you know, it, it needs to look nice. People, we need to have Billings look inviting. Yeah. You want to stop at Billings and yeah. pull in and and, and bring your family here and, and shop or go to Metro Park. And, and it doesn't need to look like a maximum security prison. It doesn't need to look run down. We don't want the garbage everywhere. And so between the new roads and just the new attitude, I think Billings is just on, is posed uh, to just explode and be an amazing place. I, I think it'll be, it, it, the significant growth that's gonna happen in the next 10 years is just gonna be phenomenal. Yeah. Let's zoom in a little on a couple of those projects. Yeah. Let's talk Billings Bypass. Where does it start? Where does it end? And, and, and what kind of uh, connectivity is it going to give yeah. folks who live in Yellowstone County? Okay. So the Billings Bypass is broken into about, I think it's five phases. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, so the first phase was, was five mile. So if you live out anywhere near the Shepherd area, you're very much aware that there's a roundabout on, on 312. Mm -hmm. And everybody goes, why is this roundabout here? And why does it go to a road that really doesn't seem to go anywhere yeah. right now? Yeah. It was, it was one of the first phases of this project. Uh, the second phase was building this bridge across the Yellowstone River. It's about a two year process to get this, this, this is a huge bridge because they made us span the entire flood fringe, mm. not just the river. I mean, you get across the river, it's easy to cart, but if you actually go to the website at, at Billings Bypass, um, they have a time lapse and you can watch them building what they've done so far. Um, but as that bridge gets completed, and that's kind of out in the middle, it's over there by Dover Park. Not mm -hmm. a lot of people are seeing it unless they go to the website. Yeah. 
months. But as that gets completed, uh, then it triggers phase three, which is connecting, it's kind of the Johnson Lane intersection area where they're gonna do that inverted diamond or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they're also expanding the interstate at that point going, going um, west. That's in year two or three. So I always tell people when you see the, the roundabout at 87 and 312 going in and yeah. you see the road along Mary Street going in, that's when that road is almost done. Okay. That's the final phase of okay. it. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else that's going on as far as Yellowstone County? Any particular projects that you, well, let's talk, let's talk <laughs> in our belt loop because I believe sure. that is mostly in Yellowstone County, but there's got to be pieces of it that are in the city of Billings as well. So ironically, there aren't. Oh, really? No, the whole thing is out in the county right oh, now. Okay. In fact, we're having a meeting with the city on, thir on Thursday afternoon to have yeah. some more discussions on how we develop that corridor. Yeah. Um, Give us a beginning to the end and the end on, right. on Interbelt Loop. Yeah, so this has been, you, you know, know yeah. <laughs> you, you've been with me through yeah. the, the hard part of this. Um, uh, I really pushed hard to get the first phase of the, the the inner belt loop done. So yeah. from Skyway Drive down to Alkali Creek, we actually got that portion of the road built. Yeah. Um, the next phase is from Alkali Creek, kind of goes up on top, goes around, and comes out at Zimmerman Trail, mm -hmm. right at the roundabout there. Yeah. Um, and so that, that all gets developed. There's about five property owners that we're working with in developing this corridor. The, the real trick is how do you develop that? Once you put the road in, you know people are gonna wanna build houses there. Yeah. And that goes back to, we were talking to zigzagging. Is this something, you know, and we've kind of had conversations with the city that we'll work with them. We don't want people just putting in huge subdivisions, uh, you know, put 400 houses on septic and wells or whatever, yeah. only to know that five years from now we're coming by with water and sewer. Right. Um, and, and with this last infrastructure bill that came out, um, that the state got their three billion, the first thing on it was water and sewer. So we're encouraging the city to invest some of that money, even though it's not the traditional way of doing it, as we, we secured the build grant to build the road, mm -hmm. to use that water sewer money and run that as a safety project for water and sewer and connect the city yeah. that way. That way then all of a sudden that, th there's not a huge burden on the, the local taxpayers to, to build that infrastructure, but then the city will benefit the, yeah. the reap the benefits of connecting to that water and sewer as that area develops and sure. grows. It yeah. just, so it's working with the property owners, trying to make sure that I, everybody doesn't get too excited and start yeah. wanting to build, uh, having that conversation. It is right now a city, it's planned as a city road in the yep. middle of the county. Yep, yep. And that's why the city wants to be at the table going, well, how does this growth happen? Because we don't want to be 10 years down the road going, I know you guys bought these houses and you put in these exp expensive systems, right. but we're coming by with water and sewer now. Yeah. And do you want to hook up? Yeah. And here's the cost and the price of your house just went up another twenty five, thirty thousand yeah. dollars because people jumped the gun. Yeah. And so we want to make sure that we're watching how that develops um, and, and go from there. Sure. All right. Any other big projects that I missed out on uh, that are coming up? I know those are two big ones and you're right. There's going to probably be some not happy trans uh, people out, out on crowded road. But yeah, when it's done, it's going to be great. <laughs> I agree with you, Dennis. When it's done, it's going to be awesome. Yeah. You know, there's, there's just so many things. We completed the remodel of the jail. Mm -hmm. um, well, we're gonna touch on jail next. Any other oh, road projects? Oh, road, big, road projects. Big road, yeah. Any other big road projects? The road projects, that's pretty much, okay. that's gonna okay. be, you know, they're resurfacing Main Street this okay. summer. Okay. So that's why Main yeah. Street's a disaster okay. right now. All right, then let's move on to the jail. I know there's been All a right. lot of work that's gone on down right. at the jail, um, and I'm sure it's been uh, an interesting time with COVID down there. So. Uh, give us a little history background uh, yeah. on the big jail project and then where we are today. Yeah, and, and it's another one of those where the opportunity of, of COVID really changed the dynamics of things. Going pre-COVID, we had just um, completed 148 bed unit for the women's section. So before that, all the women went into one section of the jail. It didn't, you know, and, and the men we divided into the bad, the really bad, the really, really bad, and those who can't play with others. Mm -hmm. We had different pods to separate them in. Yeah. The women, we just all put them in one, one pod yeah. and that wasn't fair, equitable or safe. Yeah. Uh, so we built a, a women's unit that, that divides them up and classifies them and does all of that. As, as part of that project then, what we were able to do the first time and not many jails are, uh, get this opportunity. Once the women were out of that one unit, we were able to go into each unit of the jail, take them and move them over into the, the women's old women's section and totally remodel 
that unit, which yeah. hadn't been touched in 30 years. Yeah. So we gutted all the plumbing, everything, brought it up to code, standards, and we did that for all of the units. About the time we were there and ready to go, oh, COVID hits. Yeah. So then the old section becomes our isolation and quarantine unit. And, uh, and that got us through a year of yeah. not having to release a lot of people and control COVID in our jail. Uh, I think we did a really great job. The, the newest thing we've done is we found a, a room that used to be an old laundry room that's big enough that we're going to put in a mental health unit. Oh, that'll be good. So that we can assess why people are in jail, maybe, and, and that's part of that continuum of care project that we started working on a couple of years ago, so that we can help people transitioning into jail or more specifically out of jail. Sure. So we can get them stable in jail. If, yeah. if you come to me and I, I do all the, do some basic assessments or I know that you've been diagnosed and you should be on meds, yeah. I'll get you back on your meds. Yeah. The problem is, if you're only in jail for 30 days or six months, I can keep you stable in jail. But right now the system is, there's the door, good luck, Godspeed. Yeah. And it just sets people up for failure. And so what we wanna do is have this, this unit that, that helps these people with mental issues to, to not reoffend, to get them to the support groups that they, they need to be in so that, uh, okay, you're, you're about to get out of jail. Here's your meds. We're gonna get you in contact with the mental health center, the crisis center. All these people are gonna know you're coming out with the Montana Rescue Mission. We're gonna get you stable, keep you stable coming out, get you, get you on this program, and, and that should help you progress through the system instead of just come right back into the system. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a really exciting opportunity. We're working with, uh, there's a new director at the mental health center, Rod Ostermiller is, has taken over yeah, sure, that and yeah. is doing great. Um, this, um, Continuum of care group is really, we've really got the, those groups working better together so they're not duplicating services. Uh, they're, they're realizing their specialties. Yeah. And, and so they're able to, to understand what they do well. And, and, and so that's been an exciting part of this. And moving forward, what we're trying to do is reduce the recidivism within the jail, making sure that if, if you're there just because you needed your meds and your sandwich, that yeah. we get you that versus punishing you for something that maybe mentally you shouldn't be being yeah. punished. That's, punishment isn't helping you if you have yeah. mental illness and you're not being treated appropriately. Ascertaining that, keeping the bad people out of our community. We've got a lot of bad people moving into our community right now, yeah. and we're trying to, to separate out who can get help, who needs to be kept you know, away from society right now. But that's an exciting thing that's happening at the jail. Uh, that should be happening here within the next six months as well. All right, very good. Well, Commissioner Pittman, we could probably talk for two hours. Uh, I know. You know. <laughs> Are we already at the end? Yeah, just, exactly. Oh, I, I mean, there's so much going on Absolutely. in Yellowstone County. And yeah, you're right. I think we're just seeing the beginning of the explosion. So yeah. uh, it's going to be, it's going to continue to be a, a, a busy job. Uh, sometimes a thankless job. So I will say thank you. Thank oh. you for all the time, effort, and energy that you and the commissioners put in uh, for, the, for the citizens of Yellowstone County. There's a lot going on, so I know how hard you work at it. So thank well, you. And, and thank you. Thank you for all you've done for our community. You, you get out there, you share this information with people, and, and you care about what's happening here. All right. Thanks, Commissioner. Thanks.